Welcome back to the second part of this dimensionality reduction series. The method we discuss today is PCA, the well-known principal component analysis, which was first introduced in 1901 by Carl Pearson. This video is structured as follows. We start with some intuition about the technique, then we'll look into the algorithmic details, and finally we apply PCA on a data set and do some visualizations. Let's go! There are many great resources that went into the creation of this video, such as Peter Bloem's amazing blog post on PCA, but also the PCA for Data Science book, for example. As always, you find everything in the video description. Let's start with building a conceptual understanding of how PCA works. For this, let's assume we have a bunch of observations. And here, for simplicity, we only have two dimensions, x1 and x2. The corresponding data in tabular format could look like this. The central idea of PCA is to reduce the number of dimensions by finding so-called principal components. These principal components are uncorrelated and we only keep the most informative ones to reduce the dimensionality. We will learn more about them soon. Here we don't have many choices, so we will reduce the 2D data into one dimension. If you've read other PCA tutorials, you most likely heard that this technique tries to retain as much variance as possible in the data. I always found this a bit abstract and therefore constructed a little example to better understand it. This data set represents the relative size of a city in X1 versus the cost of living in X2. We immediately observe that this data is kind of redundant because in most cases the size of a city correlates with the cost of living. So basically one value can be computed from the other one. We will highlight two data points, namely Rome, which is much cheaper than other big cities. And on top we have New York City, which is pretty expensive, but also pretty big. These are just made up examples. How would you squeeze this data set into one single dimension while preserving as much information as possible? And information is mainly the relationship between data points here. You could only use the axis x1, which reflects the size of a city, but you could also use x2, which reflects the cost of living. In fact, there are many options. We could also use this line as a new axis, or we could use this line. So which one is better? Obviously, the green line somehow captures more of the data. This spread can also be calculated, namely by measuring the variance. The formula of variance for a single feature is defined as follows. We subtract the mean from all values and square them to make the distances positive. The result is then summed up and divided by the number of samples. Overall, variance is a measure for the spread of data. When data points are far away from the center of the distribution, highlighted in red here, we have a larger variance. If they are closer to the center, we have a smaller variance. Now going back to our data set, let's have a look at the variance of our two new axes. The longer axis has a pretty large variance and the smaller one has also a smaller variance because there is less spread along this axis. Now, when we take a look at how the data looks like along these axes, we can see the variance even more clearly. Certainly, these distribution plots are not perfectly precise, it's just a sketch. At the beginning, we said that we want to reduce the 2D data into a single dimension. So, let's do that now. This can be done by projecting the data onto the new axis. We will later see how such a projection is performed in practice. Now all of our data points lie along one single dimension. Each of our originally 2D data points is assigned to a single value along these axes. In tabular form this would look like this. And when we remind ourselves of the cities from the beginning, which were Rome and New York City, we see that the left axis captures much more of the relationship between the data points and the right axis is kind of cramped. In fact, the extreme case, which is a variance of zero, would mean that all points lie at the same value on one axis. Certainly, when all data points look the same, it's harder to distinguish between them and therefore variance can serve as a measure of information in data. What we can see here are the two principal components of our data set. Both of them capture information about the size of a city as well as the cost of living. 
Therefore, you can see these axes as a combination of our original features. But the interesting piece is that these combinations capture even more information than the individual features would. That's why they are called principal. They are the main axes in our data set. It's no coincidence that I chose exactly those two axes as they together capture all of the information in the data. This can be displayed in a so-called scree plot, which shows the explained variance of each principal component. And now dimensionality reduction comes into play. Typically, we only keep the principal components that retain most of the variance in the data. So here we would just keep the first principal component and still have 90% of the information of the 2D case. In other words, we drop less informative principal components. In practice, this means all of the points are projected onto this new axis, which looks like this. Then we can get rid of the two features and only use the new axis. And our selected principal component summarizes our data set in a lower dimensional space. Of course, we can extend this principle to many dimensions, such as high dimensional images. Here's an example for the principal components of a face image dataset. Think of them like axes through the pixel space that capture most of the variation between the faces. Usually these are face characteristics like the shape of the nose and so on. Remember in the introductory video when I said that faces can be reduced to their lower intrinsic dimensionality? That's exactly what PCA is doing here. The principal components for face images are called eigenfaces because they correspond to the eigenvectors of the face image space. We will learn more about that in a second. The cool thing is that you can reconstruct any face based on these basis vectors. Here's an example of exactly that. The image is reconstructed as linear combination of the eigenfaces. Of course, reconstructing data based on the principal components has an inherent loss of information if the number of principal components is smaller than the original number of features. I also like this visualization by Peter Blöhm. It shows how the face characteristics change when walking along a principal component or eigenface. This is just like walking along our newly created axis in the previous example. Principal components are orthogonal to each other because otherwise they would capture correlated information. More specifically, they form an orthogonal basis, which we will learn more about later in this video. Technically speaking, PCA is projecting data into a new coordinate system where the axes are the principal components and this is called a basis transformation because it translates, rotates or scales the observations. This also means that for a n-dimensional data set, we will end up with n principal components, of which we just keep the most valuable ones, typically. One last remark, the classical PCA is a linear method, because we are only allowed to draw straight lines. For this data set, we will capture more variance using such a curved axis, but this is not possible. But there is an extension called kernel PCA, which also allows to perform nonlinear dimensionality reduction but we won't cover it in this video. Now that we've gained a comprehensive understanding of PCA, let's delve into the details of identifying these principal axes. Geometrically, we are looking for the line with the minimal distance to all of the points. This is nicely shown in this animation. When we project the data onto this best fitting line, like we've done before, we preserve most of the information. In higher dimensions, these lines become planes or hyperplanes. The first idea that might come to your mind is that we need to perform some sort of optimization, such as minimizing the sum of squared distances, like it's done in linear regression. We could do this in principle, for example, fitting a line with gradient descent. It turns out, however, that there exists a more efficient closed form solution to finding principal components. When explaining PCA, there are many different ways to approach this technique. Some explanations are geometric interpretations, we try to find the line with the minimal distances. Others involve lots of linear algebra, and some also talk about finding the direction of maximum variance. At the beginning, it might be difficult to accept that all of these views lead to the same way of finding principal components. 
In fact, minimizing the squared distances is equivalent to maximizing the variance. In the video description, I've put a nice blog post that mathematically derives this result in detail. It's based on Lagrange multipliers, but I won't further discuss it in this video. Instead of deriving it mathematically, we will take a look at this intuitive visualization by Alex Williams. The spread or variance along the principal axis is displayed in blue here. The distance between a data point and the axis is displayed in red. Using the Pythagoras theorem, we realize that the maximum variance and minimum distance are reached at the same time and therefore it doesn't really matter which perspective we choose. In fact, all optimization problems arrive at the same solution in the end. Okay, so what is this solution? The efficient closed form solution to finding the principal components starts with the covariance matrix. This just naturally arises in a mathematical solution. The covariance matrix shows the variances of variables on the diagonal and covariances between variables on off-diagonal positions. The variables could for example be the cost of living and the size of a city like in the example from the beginning. The covariance between two variables is the sum of the product of their deviations from their respective mean, divided by the number of observations, like shown in this formula. It tells us about the relationship between features and generally expresses the covariation of two variables, meaning if they move together in the same direction. Just for completeness, the difference to correlation is that correlation measures the intensity and direction of a relationship, whereas covariance only measures the direction. Correlation is also called normalized covariance, but it's not so important at this point. As we are interested in the direction of the largest variance, it absolutely makes sense to look at the variability in our dataset expressed by this matrix. Let's have a look at a few examples to get a feeling for the covariance matrix. For this dataset, we have a slightly higher variance of 1.3 for the feature x2, and the two variables move in the same direction, therefore the covariance between the variables is also high. And as you can see, the covariance matrix is symmetric along the diagonal. This example shows a slightly lower variance for each of the variables and no clear trends how they would move together, therefore the covariance is quite low. This means knowing the value of one feature doesn't tell us much about the other feature. Finally, here we have the same variances like in the first example, but the covariance is negative as we have a joint negative trend. So the takeaway of this is that the covariance matrix tells us about the variance and joint directions of the variables. Before we move on and discuss why the covariance matrix is relevant for finding the principal components, let's discuss some linear algebra basics which will be needed to understand the following. Points in a coordinate system are typically described with a value for each axis. If we write 1, 2, it means nothing else but 1 times the first basis vector plus 2 times the second basis vector. This makes data points nothing else but vectors themselves. Now, every matrix can be associated with a linear transformation that, for example, translates or rotates the vectors, which are data points. If we, for example, have this matrix and multiply it with our data point vectors, we can use the general matrix multiplication rule to calculate the transformation. What this means is that each row is multiplied with the coordinates of the data points and this moves the data point to a new position. So let's do that for the points on the left. When we plug them into the expression on top, we end up at these new positions. The original data space was spanned by unit vectors and looks like this. When we visualize the target space, we see what kind of transformation the matrix on top is performing. It's stretching and scaling all of our data points from the unit sphere into the ellipse space on the right. Now, linear transformation have some unique characteristics and one crucial characteristic can be described by so-called eigenvectors. These are the vectors that don't change the direction under the transformation. Let's say we have this red and blue vector and apply the matrix transformation and thereby move the vectors to these positions. 
Here the red vector still points into the exactly same direction like before the transformation, while the blue vector points somewhere else. The red vector is what we call an eigenvector because it's not changing direction under transformation. Furthermore, the length of the vector corresponds to the so-called eigenvalue. It's a measure for the intensity of the stretch in the vector's direction. A very intuitive example of an eigenvector is when you point your arm into the air and spin in circles, then your arm is the eigenvector of the rotation transformation, as it doesn't change the direction. More formally, the eigenvector equation looks like this. All it says is that multiplying an eigenvector v with the matrix A leads to the same result as multiplying the eigenvector with the corresponding eigenvalue. Therefore, the vector's direction is unaffected. The only thing that happens is that it is multiplied by some scalar, just like we've seen in the previous example. Usually, this is called diagonalizing a matrix, because instead of our matrix on top, we can just multiply with a diagonal matrix of eigenvalues. Later, we will also quickly talk about how to calculate eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Equipped with this knowledge, we can now discuss how the principal components are found based on the covariance matrix. According to a theorem called the spectral theorem, any symmetric matrix, like the covariance matrix, always has real eigenvectors and eigenvalues. The set of all eigenvalues of a matrix is also called the matrix spectrum. That's where the theorem's name comes from. This means that every covariance matrix can be diagonalized. And the amazing thing for PCA is that eigenvectors of the covariance matrix correspond to the principal components, so the direction with the highest variance. And the eigenvalues correspond to the explained variance of each principal component. Now, where is this surprising fact coming from? The covariance matrix formulation naturally arises from the mathematical optimization problem that we want to solve. I won't go further into the details here, but if you're interested in finding out how the mathematical formulation looks like, have a look at the links I've added to the video description. Now we should have everything in place to quickly go over each step of the PCA algorithm. The first step is to center the data. Centering the data means that the data is exactly at the origin of the coordinate system. This can be achieved by subtracting the mean of each feature. Some implementations additionally scale the data such that it has unit variance. The reason for doing all of this is to have the same contribution of each variable. As you can imagine, all of the projections only work if we have the same ranges for each of the axes. Step two is to calculate the covariance matrix. As we now know, the covariance matrix helps us to find a closed form solution to identifying the direction with the highest variance. It tells us about the variances of variables and between variables, meaning to which degree the variables vary together. The formula of variance is shown on top, covariance on the bottom. In both expressions, x bar represents the mean vector of the corresponding variable. The third step is the eigenvalue decomposition. As we've learned due to the covariance being a symmetric matrix and applying the spectral theorem, the covariance matrix can be diagonalized. The eigenvectors correspond to the principal components and the eigenvalues to the variance along the vectors. This is an example of how it could look like. The two vectors are the two principal components, as well as the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. The blue values are the eigenvalues, and as you can see, the spread of principal component 1 is about three times as big as principal component 2. But how do we actually calculate eigenvectors? This eigen decomposition is performed with some more linear algebra, starting with solving the characteristic polynomial for the matrix. Finally, I have to be honest with you, when you calculate PCA using your favorite programming library, most likely no eigen decomposition is performed. In practice, singular value decomposition is computed. The probably most crucial reason for this is the runtime complexity of the two methods. Eigen decomposition has a cubic complexity, while singular value decomposition has a much smaller one depending on the shape of the data matrix. SVD is a more general matrix decomposition technique 
that can also handle rectangular matrices. Remember, Eigen Decomposition only works on squared matrices. It also has many other applications beyond PCA. It calculates singular values and singular vectors, just like eigenvalues and eigenvectors. When using SVD on a dataset, we don't have to calculate the covariance matrix as we can apply it directly to the dataset. That's another reason why SVD is typically faster. The results of SVD and Eigen Decomposition are, of course, the same. Okay, so does this mean we don't need Eigen Composition at all? Not quite. Remember when I talked about kernel PCA at the beginning to learn non-linear principal components? For this technique, the data is mapped using a kernel function. In this scenario, the singular value decomposition doesn't naturally extend to the non-linear mappings and we need to make use of the Eigen Decomposition on the covariance matrix. Okay, the last step is to use the eigenvectors to project the data onto the new axis. For our example from the beginning, this projection is performed as follows. We take our two-dimensional data matrix, multiply it with the calculated eigenvectors or principal components, and get the transformed data on the principal component axis. So that's exactly what we see here, and that's the corresponding data. Symmetric matrices always have orthogonal eigenvectors. That's why the principal components are orthogonal to each other, so they are at right angles. Because they are orthogonal, it also means that they have no correlation. That's why PCA is set to project data into a decorrelated basis. It's also quite easy to prove this mathematically. Again, for this you find another link in the video description. Obviously, we want to reduce the dimensionality, therefore we only project onto the principal components with the highest variance. This can be determined using eigenvalues. So again, we take the data matrix, select only the eigenvector with the highest eigenvalue, and obtain the projections onto the first principal component. And we finally end up with these projections, and that's the corresponding data. So that's the full picture. And now let's go ahead and apply this on a real data set. Okay, so this is the notebook and you can find the link in the description. I selected a wine data set from scikit-learn and this wine data set has a bunch of features that describe different characteristics of a wine. And we have three classes of wines. I don't know exactly what they stand for, but overall we have around 200 data points with 13 features. Now here I define two functions. One is building a simple Seaborn scatter plot. The other one is using IPy volume, a very nice library to create 3D visualizations. So let's run that and it will also automatically install IPy volume if it's not yet installed. Now let's start with the first technique and I just wanted to point out here that you can use NumPy to also calculate eigenvalues and eigenvectors using this linear algebra package and you can use NumPy cov to calculate the covariance matrix. And here are examples for the th first uh, three eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. Okay, now the 2D projection is pretty simple. Of course, we use the easiest package you can use, which is scikit-learn. And here we import PCA. And as you can see, it gets imported from decomposition because it performs a decomposition. In detail, it performs singular value decomposition as you can read in the documentation. We will also time the execution so that we can compare later the different dimensionality reduction techniques. And now we just call fit transform and this will perform the, uh, the singular value decomposition. And then we visualize this and it will show this picture. So we have the three classes in a two dimensional space. And what you can do with um, this PCA object is you can also extract the eigenvalues and eigenvectors using explained variance ratio and components. So that's quite nice. And then secondly, just because we have three dimensions, let's also use them. So we can also make a 3D plot. I like this library, it's very nice for visualization. And this might in some cases help to even better um, represent data. And that's pretty much it. 
So we will continue this notebook in the next video looking at the other techniques. To finish this video, I quickly want to go over this table which we will extend with the other dimensionality reduction techniques. And for PCA, we can say it's a global technique because we incorporate all of the data at the same time. It's linear because we project onto linear principal components. Of course, there are also extensions to nonlinearity. It's a projection-based method because of this decomposition approach. The main purpose is to use the principal components for data analysis and visualization. It's deterministic. When we rerun it, it will lead to the same result, which is not true for all of the techniques. The computational complexity depends on the decomposition approach and ranges from cubic for eigenvalue decomposition to squared in the case of singular value decomposition. The only real hyperparameter is the number of principal components, which can be identified with a scree plot. Then the key idea is to decompose the covariance matrix into eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And finally, some other applications are denoising, compression or correlation analysis. Awesome, that's it for the first technique in this video. In the next video, we will have a look at multidimensional scaling. Thanks for watching and see you soon in the next one.